What's happening, hardscapers? This is episode 109 of the How to Hardscape podcast, where we talk to you about how you can start and grow your hardscaping business. And today's episode is brought to you by IQ Power Tools. They are the manufacturers of a comprehensive range of innovative power tools with integrated dust collection systems. You can go check them out at iqpowertools.com. And today we're joined by Greg Crabtree. He is the author of Simple Numbers, Straight Talk, Big Profits, a book that was recommended on one of Andy Mulder's Instagram live videos that he does every Sunday evening. That is at Mulder Outdoors if you want to catch those. And I went out, got the book immediately, wanted to get Greg on the show to discuss this book as well as his other newer book, Simple Numbers 2.0. This episode is full of great financial topics for business owners as well as those books. So go over to howtohardscape.com slash books for all of our books that we recommend you go out and listen to. And without further ado, here's our episode with Greg Crabtree. Today, we're joined by Greg Crabtree. He is a speaker, entrepreneur, financial expert, and author of Simple Numbers, Straight Talk, Big Profits, as well as Simple Numbers 2.0. And Greg, I did not ask you before we started recording how to properly pronounce your name, but I'm going to guess it is exactly as it's spelled there. Did I get it correct? It is correct. Greg Crabtree. Excellent. Greg, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. It's a, it's, you're in a field that we uh, enjoy talking about. And uh, we enjoy having people like you on the show to talk about financials. And especially after reading your book, Simple Numbers, uh, it really eye-opening, a lot of great takeaways from that book. So if you haven't already gone out and grabbed it, uh, you should definitely get on that. Get the ebook, get the physical copy or whatever it may be. Greg, let's get started here to get to know a little bit more about yourself uh, before we get into the book. Can you give our audience a little bit of context about your background and how you got started in your industry? Yeah, I, you know, I was one of those folks that uh, decided as a chicken farmer kid growing up on the, on the farm that I, f- I figured out pretty quickly that gathering seven to 8,000 eggs by day uh, by hand was not a good career path. So I, I decided accounting sounded pretty good because they worked in an air-conditioned office. So that was the extent that I did with my career selection and, um, you know, got into it and, you know, got out of school in first year. I mean, it was like, oh, gosh, what have I done in my life? <laughs> and, and, and just like most professions, though, you, you kind of say, OK, well, there, there's some good here, but what there's more. There, there's got to be. Uh, kind of my why in life is, there is there's got to be a better way. And so, so it's kind of one of those that, you know, through enduring the process of learning my trade, um, I was really fascinated by why did some businesses succeed and why did some fail? And mostly in the private business community, I, you know, I, we, we don't work with any public companies and, and public companies kind of live in a different world anyway, for the most part. Now, but when it comes down to real business, everyday kind of stuff, doing the necessaries like what you do for a living, you know, it's like, okay, well, why do some people make it work and, and build wealth and have a successful exit? And, and why do others struggle and always seem to be chasing the next dollar, you know, to pay off the last dollar? And, and so, you know, I, I spent time with a CPA firm, worked for a bank as a, their v, uh, controller, VP of finance, but then left and started my own practice. And over the years, I just had projects that I would work with clients on and learn about their business. But I started paying attention to how they saw the data. And I started to realize that, you know, my successful clients had a different way of looking at financial inform- information that accountants don't look at. And, and so I, I started learning from them rather than me teaching them. And, and really over time, you start to realize, you know, there is this seamless connection to a, a really good entrepreneur of understanding the connection of profit and cash flow. And, and it's not an easy connection if you're in a complex business that has a time differential of when you make money versus when you get the money. And, and, you know, in the landscape industry is a great example of there's landscapers who are always chasing a dollar because they're putting out their money first. And the really good landscapers are actually able to stay cash ahead of things just because of how they manage their business and how they manage terms. 
But even though if you get the cash piece correct, you still got to be profitable. And to be profitable, it's this blend of, of the labor that you deploy. How do you manage it to its full effectiveness? And then how do you price it effectively? And how do you maintain that? And depending on what area of the country you're in and what your seasons are, you know, can you be consistently profitable 12 months out of the year? Do you have to have a, an auxiliary business model in the off seasons uh, if, if your weather is not consistent 12 months? And so it's been an industry that we've done a ton of work in. And, um, you know, actually the, one of my, I call him client zero, uh, is the, was a, a landscaping company in Omaha, Nebraska that, we actually use them as the guinea pig to develop the more advanced version of labor efficiency of splitting it between direct labor and management labor efficiency. And that's something I talk about in the Simple Numbers 2.0 book that just came out last, uh, last November. So when you go out and look for the books, there's actually two Simple Numbers books. Simple Numbers Straight Talk Big Profits is the first one that was written 10 years ago. And then the 2.0 book uh, got out last year. And Greg, uh, one of those, one of my favorite quotes from that first book, uh, revenue is for show and profit is for dough. Now I want to come full circle in this interview back to that. And I want to get started kind of where you started in the book. Uh, and I want to ask you why I, you almost right away kind of talked about owner's salary and why I want to ask you, why is that such a good place to start a financial book talking about financials for a business? Well, it, it, it really is built around this idea. You'll see this a lot in the franchise business industry where they'll talk about this term ODI, owner's discretionary income. And it is one of the worst ideas that anybody ever came up with because essentially what it's trying to get you to do is look at the profitability of your business before the owner takes any compensation. And that's got to be one of the dumbest ideas ever because the reality is you are working in your business. And, and for all of the... Uh, the credit to Michael Gerber for writing the e-myth and talking about working on your business and not in your business. Well, I got news for you. you. There's still a lot of working in your business, no matter how big you are until you get to, you know, super big size. And, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. You got to do both, but you have to respect the value of the task. And no matter if it's an employee or you as the owner who's performing a task an employee would perform, you must respect that. Your labor that you pay that's not affiliated, you know, not related to you that works in your business, you must pay them a market wage or else you're not going to have workers. Well, why should you be any different for the job that you do? Now, as I always like to shock owners into this thinking is, well, hey, by the way, you know, I, I know you think, oh, I'm special and I'm unique. I said, I got news for you. As an owner of a business, all of us can be re replaced and some of us can be improved upon. So don't think you're that special. I mean, it, it, at the end of the day, uh, it may take two people to replace you. It may take a half a person to replace you. But at the end of the day, we want to search for financial truth. And financial truth isn't found in general accepted accounting principles. It's found and what I could, the term I use is functional finance. We need functional financial information that makes the most sense to the person using it to know, are you making money and is cash flowing sufficiently to allow you to not have to extraordinarily resort to putting cash in the business when it doesn't need it or borrowing money unnecessarily in that process. How do I decide as an owner what to pay myself? Uh, I, I mean, I could go to an accountant and they could say to tell me to pay myself the lowest number and take owner's draws. And, uh, you know, that's the way to go about it. But what's what's your opinion to uh, decide what to pay myself as an owner? Well, you know, I mean, there's plenty of available salary survey data that you can actually. So if you're a. Uh, if you're a million dollar business, you, your, your position is not president. You, you may have a corporate title of president, but your, your position is general manager. And so you just go on salary.com or any of the other online salary survey sites, glassdoor.com and say, you know, what's the general manager salary for a million dollar business? Um, 
And then as you grow, you know, there, and there's other weight survey information available. We, we subscribe to a, a Economic Research Institute salary assessor. So we can actually pull a weight survey for any position from CEO down to dog catcher. You know, so, so it's like, you know, it, it, that number is not hard to find out. Here's the thing that I will tell your audience is we're batting a thousand on this. Every client that I've gotten to that was playing the, the low end game, taking a low salary to meet meet or even be below minimum IRS standards uh, to save payroll taxes, in essence, that once I got them to do the right thing and do the right salary, they not only made more salary, they were actually more profitable. And it really goes back to behavioral economics. There's a great field of study that looks at economics from the standpoint of interaction with human behavior. And when I can get you to draw a full market wage as your salary and you see the truthful profitability of the business and it's now lower than what it was, you respond to that and you will work harder and work more effectively to get back to that profitability that you had, even though your salary you know, used to be lower you know, and, and cause that. And, and it's like, why wouldn't you want to do that? But every time that we've had somebody do that, they, the, the payroll taxes is a canard. I mean, you know, you're, you're, you're focusing on the wrong issue there because even though it might be a number that you think is significant, you know, three to five to $10,000 difference, I'm telling you, you'll make it up in other ways just because you're looking at truth. Absolutely. And getting into, I guess, talking to accountants and them giving opinions about reducing your tax bill as opposed to what I read in your book is about, you know, the more you pay in taxes, it means the better your business is, the better the uh, the heartbeat of your business, the lifeline of your business just means you're doing better. It doesn't necessarily mean that you need to go out there, buy a new truck because your accountant says that's going to reduce your tax bill. Can you speak on this a little bit? Well, the first thing is, is when people say, uh, saves you taxes. So that is the biggest lie in the accountant's vocabulary because you have to say what is saving taxes versus just shifting it to a different year. And, and so a lot of these things are time shifting techniques. And so, um, so from that standpoint, that's, that's the first thing. And you see this a lot with cash basis um, taxation rules of oh, you need to pay a bunch of expenses at the end of the year and that'll save you taxes this year and just, just pay the ones that you would have paid next year. Well, my, my contention is I don't want to do that because I, I, you know the last time I checked, the people who make the most money, they pay a bill at the last possible moment that they have to and, and, and incur an expense only if they have to. And when you tell yourself, Oh, I'm going to spend this in the next three or four months. Yeah, we need this piece of equipment. Let's go ahead and buy it now. And it's like, listen, you, you went 52 weeks out of the year and didn't need it. What, what makes you think you have to have it now? So unless you have a, a need to create greater productivity with it, then that, that's just the biggest you know, waste of money. Because here's the deal. To increase expenses, you're spending a dollar to save 40 cents in tax. I, last time I checked, that, that economics doesn't work. Now, you, you spend a dollar to make more than a dollar in profit and then pay the tax on that. Okay, that's a good deal. But you've got to look at things. And I address this more in the 2.0 book about looking at these discretionary choices that business owners use and think, put it through a return on investment analysis to say, am I going to gain from having this spend? rather than a reductive mentality that saving taxes is. And, you know, and the best example is we had this client that was in the snow removal business and, and I did a, a planning session with him and, and basically I showed him it. I mean, he was trying to pay no taxes at the end of the year because he could go buy a new snow, snow plow, fully 100% finance it, but take section 179 depreciation. And so he was, he had all of this equipment. He was saving taxes uh, in that year of purchase at, you know, a 10 to 15% tax bracket. And I showed him and says, well, that's all well and good, but I want you to know that for you to ultimately repay that debt, you're going to have to ultimately have some taxable income that's probably going to be at the 40% tax bracket, uh, federal and state. And, you know, 
why would you want to save taxes at the 10 to 15% bracket to then just pay them later when you're having to repay the debt and have to use 35 to 40% tax bracket money you know, to go do that? That, that makes no sense whatsoever. And, and so you see this in equipment intensive industries like landscaping, snow removal, any other machinery driven, you know, business model where they can take the section 179 depreciation. Coming back to that initial quote, uh, revenue is for show and profit is for dough. I see a lot of companies getting into debt and justifying it because it's pushing their profit number up. And it, especially during this time when there's so much work out there, uh, we're all so busy. And if we can just be more efficient, get get more equipment and take on more projects, we're going to make that revenue number. But what's your opinion on debt? I, I know that I, I read in your book, debt forces you to be profitable in the future or you default, or, uh, you know, you know, it's forcing you. It's, it's actually, it's not like if there's a downturn in the economy, you can just kind of ride it out. You actually are forced to be profitable because of that debt. Can you expand on all this that I've kind of gone off on a tangent here? Well, I mean, I think the easiest way to look at it is segregate debt into two categories. So I have debt to finance a functional piece of equipment. I'm okay with that. If you know that you have the work to make that piece of equipment valuable and productive, because that note payment on a truck, uh, a tractor, uh, you know, piece of equipment, whatever, it, that note payment, by the time you work through all the, the adjustments that the accountants do with it, that note payment is essentially the expense over time, you know, of that piece of equipment. So you just got to make sure if I go pay a thousand dollars a month, you know, for a production vehicle, can I produce two thousand a month, you know, profit from that three thousand? What what of that number is? And so so that's really that's an okay usage of debt. The not okay usage of debt is when you are taking distributions out of the business to fund your own choice of lifestyle. And it's against your line of credit and you're not bringing your line of credit down to zero. So line of credit is backed by your accounts receivable. I would whole lot rather you take an approach where I have zero on the line of credit. I need to be better at charging up front for my, my projects or getting some money down. Or if I'm doing monthly services, I'm billing at the beginning of the month and I'm generally staying cash flow ahead of my work as I'm doing it throughout the year. That is an extremely capital efficient business model that gives you the greatest return on investment. But once again, debt is just a way to temporarily alter the natural flow of cash flow from, from a business transaction. And you've got to be careful that you understand the difference of when am I making profit and if I have profit, we, we have, if I can get you to where you're fully capitalized in your business, we, we call it the 40-30-30 rule. So if I'm fully capitalized, which means I've got two months of operating expenses in cash, everything, all my, all my labor plus my office expenses, not my cost of goods sold, which I should have terms on. So if I have two months worth of that cash and I have zero drawn on a lot of credit, I can then operate in a way that says, you know, for every dollar of profit that I make, I got to set aside roughly 40% for taxes, federal and state. I got to leave about 30% of that profit dollar in the business to fund future growth. And I can distribute 30% of that profit reliably once a quarter after tax. And so you start to then take taste the fruits of your, your labor as a business owner. The problem is, is People start to try to take those profit distributions before they've allowed the business to become fully stable and fully capitalized. And if you could just be patient for another 18 to 24 months, in most cases, you'll be there. And then now you start to see this cash flow that comes off the business. Now, the problem is, is if you don't ever see that cash flow coming off the business, you got a different problem. It means you're probably not profitable. and you know, you've got to do something about that profitability matrix and make sure that it's not about being busy. It's about being profitable with the work that you have. 
Definitely. And with that being said, how much do we need for our capital safety net? Or, you know, does that depend depending on the owner and their, their risk, their risk tolerance? Or how would you? I, you know, I, I've, I've watched this for 15 years and since we came up with the idea. And I've never seen it beyond the two months number. So if you take your monthly payroll and take your, your office, your rent, uh, payroll taxes, just the common non, uh, non-COGS expenditures, uh, and take a month's worth of that times two, that's the amount of cash that you should always, you should act as if that number is zero in, in the bank account when you have. So if that number is $300,000. You've got to go from thinking that 300000 in cash is a lot to going, that's really zero. And then everything above the 300000 is then that's the money that, you know, I can do things with. Now, here's, here's the, the surprising thing that we've seen over these years that we've been following these principles. Growth is not a question of cash. So once you get your business healthy and fully capitalized, growth is a question of execution. You don't need to spend money to grow. You actually create cash if you run your terms correctly and you pay your bills on proper terms and and you collect cash on projects and those things. If you do all of those things the right way, your your growth issues is just winning the next customer and getting that next project scheduled and keeping profitability consistent in the business. Um, but, you know, so many entrepreneurs say, oh, if I could just go borrow $200,000, you know, my business would be great. That's not your problem. If you need to go borrow $200,000, more than likely, you're not profitable enough in, in the business that you're in. So you got to get profitable with what you got and then grow into that, that stable, you know, fully capitalized base. And then all of a sudden you start to realize, oh, man, this is this is cool. This business works a lot better than I thought. I just want to take a moment from today's episode to thank IQ Power Tools for being a sponsor of today's episode. This episode is brought to you by IQ Power Tools, the firm that builds smart, tough, award-winning, clean-cut concrete and masonry power tools that eliminate dust. Eliminating dust from your job site is smart, it saves time, it saves money, and it saves lives. Keep your job site safe and healthy for you and your crew as well as the neighbors and the homeowner around you and look professional while you're on the job site with these IQ Power Tools dust eliminating systems. Visit them at iqpowertools.com and learn how to implement healthier and more efficient work practices for your next project and give them a thanks on their social channels at IQ Power Tools for sponsoring the How to Hardscape podcast. Now back to our episode. Now, one of the concepts I read about in your book uh, was really awesome, especially if you're listening to this, you're into sports. Uh, The salary cap professional team and business in terms of managing your money, in terms of finances, you only have a finite set of money, just like a professional team would have a salary cap. Uh, how, How do we decide what money is available to spend in our business on things like labor? And where to allocate that money as we grow? So in the first book, I used a simplistic labor efficiency ratio. So if you ever hear hear somebody say LER, you'll know that they've read simple numbers. So LER stands for labor efficiency ratio. And so it's where we take gross margin. So we take revenue minus COGS, and that's your gross margin. That's really your true top line of your business, not revenue, but it's revenue after COGS is the true economic top line of the dollar, first dollar you can spend internally in your business. If you take gross margin divided by all labor, whether it's management labor or direct labor, doesn't really matter. Um, you know, that number is your overall labor efficiency ratio. And so in the first book, that's the one we used. And it, it really is still a pretty amazing calculation because Somewhere between a 1.8 and a 2 is what you can spend on labor. It's as simple as that. Uh, if you want to be 15% profitable, it's going to be closer to a 2. And if you want to be about 10% profit, it's going to be about a 1.8. And, and it just, it's really freaky as to how often it stays within those parameters. Now, our client who I was referring to that was a landscaper in Omaha, 
we started developing then a breakdown that says, okay, well, let's identify who your direct labor is. And so it's basically everybody who does field labor, field supervision, faces the customer, you know, those things. And then everybody who's administrative, the owner, accounting, customer service, you know, back office, you know, is, is management labor. And so we looked at a direct labor efficiency ratio so we could get a finer calculation on a segment basis. And so when we, and, and I didn't, I'd started doing the research on his business before we finished the first book, but I just didn't have enough of it done to put it in the first book, but it's in the second book, um, you know, that we show this. And, and what we saw, saw was is in landscaping and irrigation, he was about a three and a half to a four labor efficiency ratio of gross margin to directly associated labor to each of those two categories. But what we saw was when he did uh, mowing, he was only at like a two and a half. And, and so, so you can start to see when you get more gross margin for a dollar of direct labor deployed, the market is giving you a reward for either your management the expertise of the person or, or some additive value like technology enhancement or something like that to say, hey, this isn't a common skill set. Guess what? The market pays you less when it's a common skill set that any of us can do. Most of us can mow grass. Uh, I would have no idea how to fix an irrigation system. Yeah, and, and I would have no idea of how to plan a landscaping project with planting plants and making it beautiful and, and I can dump I can dump mulch. That's about the best I can do. You know, and, and so so it starts to show you how the market values the labor that's being deployed. Now I got news for you. At the end of the day, there's nothing productive that happens in business without labor. And it's the winners in business are the ones that know how to deploy labor the most effectively and profitably and get the most production out of that labor. And so in their case, you know, they presented this information to their team. And one of the guys on the mowing team, you know, he piped up after he shared it with his employees. And he said, well, looks like to me, we shouldn't be in the mowing business. <laughs> and, and so this is, this is a guy that's making 10 bucks an hour as a, as a, a mowing grass. And he, he spoke the words of wisdom. And he looked at it and said, well, if I can get a four doing irrigation and landscape, why in the hell am I doing mowing? Now, now, I say that to say there are people, we have clients that just do mowing and do it extremely well. So it's not to say that you can't make profit at a $2.50 labor efficiency ratio for your mowing contract, but you've got to have, you, what's, the, what's the competing offset to that? Well, I can't spend as much on management of that. I've got to have that very controlled and efficient to where I can't spend as much back office and control and coordination for a low margin activity. I've got to deal with it with volume. And I become very sensitive to volume versus things that I get a much higher margin on, I can have some more variability. You know, you know landscaping and irrigation are project driven. They come and go and I'll have some busy months and I'll have some less busy months. If you're in a, a climate that has mowing 12 months out of the year, you're mowing grass every two weeks. You know, so, you know, so you're just much more predictable. And so those are the trade-offs. Once you see what the signature is of your business model, then you start to optimize it and say, okay, how do I keep labor pro productive every week, every month? And, and you've got a measurement that just like in the NFL, you know, I got a measurement of, okay, how many yards did my offense, you know, produce? Well, I got a measurement of how many dollars did my labor produce on that? You know, it's the same kind of measure to tell me, are we producing as much? Are we producing less? And it gives you a feedback mechanism to say, you know, is it, is it the labor's fault or is it in my if my labor cost is going up like it is in these days, am I adjusting my prices to make sure my labor's working as hard as ever? I'm just not charging enough because my cost is going up. Okay, well, I got to compensate for that. And sometimes you bump into an edge of the market to where, you know, the market won't pay anymore. Well, then I've got to then work backwards towards, okay, let's find a faster, better way to do this with us less labor but it's just less labor that I've got to pay more because it needs to be more effective. And so you start to see 
once you have that data, the best business owners will take that data and make the right choices. But in absence of the information, you just don't know if you're making progress or not. That was great. Uh, getting into talking about uh, finances in terms of what to do with them. Is there anything we can do as a business owner when we're looking at labor, looking at who to hire next? Is there anything that we can do or look at in our business to say, this is the person I need next because the numbers are telling me this? Or is it more so the owner looking at what they don't want to do in their business, more of like an emotional uh, response to who they need to hire next? How would you go about deciding that in a business? There you're going to break it into once once you go to the more advanced view of looking at direct labor efficiency and management labor efficiency, you're going to find that once you get over a million dollars of revenue, the direct labor efficiency number gets pretty hard baked. It, it kind of is what it is, and and so you know that you know if I if I'm trying to hit a a three LER say, you know then you know for every um, for every dollar of labor that I add to the team, I got to go get three dollars more gross margin. So that's a pretty simple calculation. The management labor piece is to your point of the owner says, oh, okay, well, I hear all these people who got more free time. They're not working in their business as much. And I, I need me one of those jobs and says, well, that's great. And then we've got a situation right now where a client of ours, you know, wants to add this person who's going to make, you know, essentially about $160,000 a year. Uh, in, in an operations role, different industry, but uh, and but the, it, this is another one of those amazing simple numbers, in that roughly for every dollar of management labor you add to the payroll, regardless of function, you need to add a minimum of six to a high of a ten. Eight's a good average in revenue, and so so usually when somebody wants to go hire that that operations uh, overseer, operations manager, maybe you call them a COO, whatever you want to call them. But let's say you add $100,000 to the management labor bucket. I can tell you that at a minimum, you're going to have to add $800,000 of top line revenue to justify it. And maybe even closer to a million, but somewhere between 800 and a million. And so do you have a mechanism once you add that person? What's going to be the catalyst that creates that extra 800 to a million in revenue? just because they're there. Are you not getting to that work today? Well, that's a good good argument for an operations person. Hey, we could do more. I just can't get enough throughput of our current team, so I need that operations person to make us more effective. Well, great. You know, you can you can go hire that person and then we will help hold you accountable every month so we look at the data of saying, well, that, is that top line going up 10 times what you paid that person? So if you pay them with 10 grand a month, did the top line go up 100,000? Oh, not this month. Okay, great. Well, can we hurry it up? You know, what's the plan to get that number moving up as fast as possible? Because otherwise, you just took it off the bottom line. And so getting entrepreneurs to think strategically of saying, okay, you, it's not that, you know, there's, you can do anything you want to in business. It just has a consequence. And what we're good at is actually quantifying the consequence. Putting myself into this seat, thinking about what I would do next, my next step in my business. I don't quite know what that that is yet because right now at this moment, I love being in the field and I love being an owner operator, having my hands on everything. And it's difficult for me to give up that control. But if I was thinking about who to hire next, I wouldn't say it's this, but I would say maybe a salesperson to take care to, you know, take care of all the leads coming in and, you know, put their hands in the business in, in that direction. But, but Greg, how do I, how do I justify something like that? Because right now, currently I'm not charging in my business for a salesperson. Should I be raising my rates to get myself to that stage? Because adding a salesperson is just going to free up my time, not necessarily make me more efficient in the field and produce more revenue, right? So a couple of points on that. So let's start with pricing first as a strategy. So we we tons of discussions on this topic lately. We're in an interesting time where everybody's a little off center in their understanding of what a real price is at the moment because of all the COVID disruption. 
we've got rising wages that are rampant, you know, across the economy in certain buckets. You've got tremendous demand that exceeds every industry's capacity to deliver at the moment. Now, there's a point of where you've got to kind of stare into the mist and figure out what price can I charge that somebody's willing to say yes to because I can get to it sooner than the next guy but it's not a price that's so high that they'll just go without it. That, that's a hard line to find, but that's what you're aiming for. Because pricing is, we, you, you must break away from cost-based pricing. You know, I always tell people who bill by the hour. If you bill by the hour, there's only two possible outcomes. You either gave away your expertise or you charge for your ignorance, one of the two. I, billing by the hour is one of the dumbest methodologies known to mankind in, in billing for value because there's times that you're on your game, there's times that you're off your game, and there's times that you're giving away your expertise. And so the key is what you want to do is bill the optimal market value for the segment of the market that you're trying to go capture. And then the effective business owner is going to go manage that labor to its lowest cost to meet that deliverable standard at that value. And that's the, that's the methodology that delivers the greatest profit. And, and so if you approach it to where, oh, well, here's what we're doing today. Oh, my cost change. Oh, I need to bump my pricing a little bit to cover that cost. You are going to be so off of market because you can't, that's incremental thinking. And that, that's just, you know, costs are always going to be changing. And so the key is you always adapt to charging the market and then managing costs to the market. And as long as it, you know, I, I'm a firm believer in the free market. And as long as I don't have a, a uh, controlling force like an insurance company or somebody like that that's controlling my pricing, then the market will heal itself. It, it, it's an incredibly, you know, uh, you know, flexible entity of its own, you know, in that process. Now, the other thing in terms of decisions to do next, though, which I thought was a good question that you ask. Here's the thing. In the first book, I talk about the, the black hole. And the black hole exists between a million and five million of revenue. And it's, it, the things that you're talking about are probably more driven more so by the black hole effect than anything. And there's a reason why between a million and five million is the darkest time for a business and $3 million is the deepest, darkest moment of the black hole. And that's because to go through that phase, you have to do one of two choices. I have to stretch every resource to its breaking point and get through it that way and then backfill as I can or I'm going to accept no profit, maybe even lose a little money, pre-hire the people I think I'm going to need, go sell to the market to drag, to get those people utilized and get through it, and hope I don't go bankrupt by the time I get to $5 million. Now, you can tell by the way I describe those which one that I prefer. It's not fun, but I'm telling you the entrepreneurs who stretch and run through the three million to the four to the five as fast as possible, those are the people that survive. The ones that will make a, have a great little business, controllable, um, some flexibility, but it's gonna have some heartache is if you stay around two and a half million and below, you can make a really good profit. Uh, in today's world, in the landscaping world, there's also people that are willing to buy those businesses when you're ready to kind of do something else. So there's a decent, you know, it's not a super premium, but it's a little more than just standard cash flow value. Um, you know, so that's one advantage that you would have. But the key is understanding this dynamic of, you know, it's like the old country song, you know, when you're going through hell, keep on going. Well, when you start getting to two and a half million, you better decide right then. Can I push through three and get to five or should I just stay here at two and a half and bank some resources and then maybe decide to run past three when I feel a little better about it? And that's super, super critical. When it comes to compensating labor, this came up in your book as well in terms of people aren't always driven by money and money isn't always the most important thing to be 
you know, say just redistributing your profits to your employees, whatever it might be, they may be driven by something else, especially in today's market with our labor shortage and especially in a labor intensive industry like ours. Greg, what are some, I guess, out of the box ways that we can do to attract employees besides, say, raising their wages or offering some sort of uh, a benchmark profit share if, if we reach a certain uh, revenue number on a job? Well, I mean, you're seeing that now in terms of worker flexibility. I mean, tons of demand for being able to work remotely, uh, even as COVID has started to wane, you know, people are saying, you know, can I, hey, I, I don't want to come back to the office. And, you know, but uh, last time I checked, you guys kind of do a lot of stuff out in the field. So other than your office workers, uh, you don't have a lot of opportunity for that remote work. And and so, so but certainly that is a huge benefit, you know, you know, from that standpoint. I mean, I think it really comes down to you've got to look at, you know, your 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 production workers in, in your industry. It is all about pay and 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 maybe some flexibility for time off, you know, but I, I got news for you. You're in an agricultural business and you gotta plow with your lights on sometimes. And it's it's just what comes with it. Um, and, and for the management side of things, you, you've got to manage between, you know, some of those benefits that those people get, but when you've got a whole company that not everybody can share in, in that work environment, you got to worry about, you know, some potential, you know, conflict of, oh, well, you know, they're working in the office. They don't have to do what we do. And, and you, you can have some infighting even from that, from an economic standpoint, the only bonus system that, that we've seen that we recommend is one that's based on great game of business, uh, kind of a, you know, take, take somebody's base pay and give them a 10 to 15 percent you know, bonus based on the company's performance. And even there, I'm a little on the softer side of being careful because most, most entrepreneurs fall into this trap of thinking that if I'll just give people an incentive-based pay system, they'll manage themselves. And that could, couldn't be the farthest from the truth. It might work for a while, but it is not going to work in the long run because people are just not self-managing. There's a great behavioral economic study based on New York cab drivers and, and New York cab driver will rent their cab from the cab company for 12 hour shifts. And the data consistently shows that on a slow fare day, they'll sit in the cab for 12 hours. On a good fare day, they quit at two o'clock and quit early. And it's like, why would you do that? That is the exact opposite of what a logical thinking human would do. But everybody kind of has this belly full mindset of when my belly gets full, I slow down. And, and so, you know, the challenge in the human production engine business models like landscaping, you know, restaurants and, you know, or, or product, any, you know, production, you know, type, you know, type businesses is you've got to create this consistency and expectation and you have to manage that work. And the reason why those workers need a four or five LER in a lot of those business models is because you have to have management that is checking in. So our, our client is probably the most successful lawn mowing businesses uh, that you know they can live, they can make money in that two and a half labor efficiency ratio range because they're constantly checking in with their mowing crews to, um, you know, they store their equipment closer to the, the, the areas that they mow so there's not drive time lost. And they're checking in with them about every one to two hours to keep them on schedule. And are you on schedule? Are you having equipment issues? Did you have somebody drop out middle of the day? Do we need to send a backup person to help you, you know, stay on target? Anything that doesn't get done today that gets shifted in tomorrow is a forever lost opportunity of production. And so, so those are the companies that win. I, I'm still pretty soft on the idea that other than, you know, potentially that, you know, gain sharing bonus for everybody, uh, I, I generally caution entrepreneurs to be really careful about other than, you know, paying out a spot bonus you know, for something like that, don't, don't get drug into the variable comp, you know, uh, you know, system, because you, you just, you're just going to get hammered at the end of the day. 
And I, I was pleasantly surprised about the the aspect of culture in a business being brought up, uh, especially in the second half of the book, quite often uh, in a numbers book and in, in a book about, you know, knowing your numbers, how important culture is in a business. Can you can you touch on that as we kind of wrap things up? What why why is culture so important and why was it brought up in a, in a numbers book? Well, it, 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 it's just one of those things that, you know, we, we get to peek inside the real happenings of hundreds and hundreds of businesses. And I got news for you, the, the companies that state their culture, they live their culture and, and, and it, and it's a culture that, you know, some of the businesses wouldn't be for everybody. Um, you know, and, and so, um, you know, they're, I think it's one of those that I see it brought up a lot of times as an excuse to to explain away why a company's not profitable because oh we're we're working on our culture. It says, well, great, you know, but you're not going to have a business to do anything here if you don't fix that. And 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 so it it is this tough subject to discuss when it deals with money, but you got to go there. It's it's a briar patch you just have to jump into of saying, listen. You can be profitable and have a great culture all in this in the same thing. And there's a great, you know, so I'm unapologetically an Alabama graduate and an Alabama Crimson Tide fan. And we've won a few national championships in the last few years. And, um, you know, and Coach Saban, you know, he's on he's got this famous video that's out there on the Web where he talks about says, listen, here, here's the thing. Underperformers don't like working with high achievers. And high achievers don't like working with underperformers. So you, you can't afford to have both of them in the same building if you're going to be successful. So figure it out, work on it. And, and so many times we, we pass on doing the hard thing in our business to call out that underperformer and, and really hold them accountable and, you know, it's, it's an important thing. And, 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 you know, I've got to be held accountable. And one of the things I learned, we, our firm merged with a, a larger firm, you know, about a year and a half ago. And I, I'll be honest with you. First thing I, I benefited from that merger is I'm now held accountable by the corporate office. And, and what I've learned in the first year and a half after merging is I underperformed for the 30 previous years that I had my own firm because I wasn't accountable. They haven't asked me to do a single thing that I, you know, know is is the right thing to do, and and it's like it's just the fact that you know I've got to watch certain things and report on those things. I have somebody to report to rather than oh I know that number, and, and it's the stuff we tell clients all the time. Uh, well, you know, are you are you collecting on your your slow receivables? Are you don't do business with people who don't pay you timely? Uh, are you charging enough? Are you taking care of underperforming employees? I, you know, it's all of those things. I mean, it, at the end of the day, it is not rocket science, folks. I mean, it's, it's, it's really the uncommon thing of common sense in, in 99% of the cases. And as we close up here, Greg, this is awesome. A great chance to talk with you. Once again, revenue is for show and profit is for dough. That was a great line in your book that I really enjoyed. And Greg, where can our audience go to find out more about you, yourself, anything that you've got going on as well as your books? Yeah. Um, so the best place to look for the, for the books, uh, the books have a website, simplenumbers.me. Uh, and so that's the, the website that has both of the books. It has some free tools. There's some video links. Um, there's actually quite a few of my presentations. I freely allow people to record my presentations when I give them. And so if you just search on YouTube, uh, you know, there'll be quite a few of my, my presentations out there uh, to reach out to me. If you have any question about, uh, you know, if we can help your company, uh, greg.crabtree at cricpa.com. Uh, is my email address. So feel free to reach out and just shoot me an email. And then uh, Mike Maxson is one of my partners who does all of the coordination of those things. So Michael will get in touch with you and kind of go through kind of our program. But on the, the simple numbers.me website, it kind of there's a place that talks about our consulting services and how we help businesses. But, you know, I'm kind of one of those is like, you know, hey, if you, you know, 
we think a lot of this is practical. So if, if you struggle in application, hey, you know, then happy to help you with that. I, I'm just as thrilled at times when people come up to me that have read the book and applied it and have been successful. And that's great, too. You know, and and the good news is, is for those of you that are audiobook people, I've, I've gone in the studio and recorded both audiobooks. They should be coming out this fall. Uh, so I read them both myself. And uh, so that'll it'll have the authentic sound to it. Uh, so looking forward to those getting out there as well. And Greg, I just wanted to thank you to join me on this podcast to get this information into our industry, as well as the the content that you're putting out there, especially those two books. Uh, we've had Sean Van Dyke and Mike McCallowitz of Profit First and Profit First for Contractors uh, on this podcast talk about numbers and, and the c- content that they're putting out there for business owners. This really just falls in line and 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 just speaking to my audience right now, if you've read those books, you definitely need to go check out Simple Numbers, both books by Greg. Uh, huge endorsement by my part. It's been uh, great to, I mean, it just covers so many different things and you put it as simple as possible for us. It really helps us, uh, myself uh, especially. So Greg, thank you so much. Yeah, well, like I said, the one thing we really love about your industry is you're what we call one of the necessaries. And so you, you guys really just came through the pandemic with flying colors in, in most of our clients' cases. And, and there's that that's really the businesses I love to work with are the necessaries, the ones that, hey, you know, you're, you're just out there doing the good stuff that everybody needs. But there's no reason why you shouldn't be profitable and shouldn't be benefiting from the risk that you're taking as an owner. And just make sure you're maximizing you know, uh, what, what should be coming out of the business for your benefit. Absolutely. Greg, thank you for your time. Good deal. All right. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for listening to today's podcast episode. Visit us at howtoheartscape.com slash books. See a list of books that we have there that we recommend you check out to help you in your hardscaping business. And let us know what you want to learn about in future episodes by reaching out to us on our social channels. We are at How to Hardscape on Facebook and Instagram. And thank you to IQ Power Tools for sponsoring today's episode. Go check out their War on Dust tour this summer. See if they're going to be in your neighborhood by checking out iqpowertools.com. And we look forward to meeting with you next week on the How to Hardscape podcast.